I'd like to talk a little bit more about perceiving the aura. So we've talked in the past a little bit about how to use the different sensory yeah, modalities we have as a human to discern energy and we can use all of them also to discern the aura. Uh, but it's also relatively hard to feel the aura compared to feeling the energies in the body because they're more subtle. So your own vibration also needs to be at a slightly more subtle level to be able to pick up the energies of the aura. I will start with what is for me the most yeah, simple method, namely using the hand. So we open our hand chakras and after opening our hand chakras it is very much about being aware of um, whether the energy is in a way flowing uh, unobstructed or it is in a way under something's control. So if I'm away from everybody and everything then the energy is just going to be dictated by me. My energy will flow as is natural to me. But at the moment I start touching somebody's aura then the other person is actually dictating the movement of the energy and you can feel the change. But to be able to feel the change you yourself have to be passive. If I'm all the time like generating a big field and saying like okay this will be my way and this will be the way I want it to be and the energy will move how I want it to move then you're never going to be able to sense another person unless that other person overpowers your impulse. So then the auras are going to clash and mingle and then you get yeah, more or less a feeling of something else is struggling against your will and you can pick up on something but it won't be a very natural state of aura which you're picking up on because the other person is not relaxed they are in a way in a tug of war with you energetically so to be able to sense you have to be in a way neutral you have to disappear you have to not lose yourself but you have to stop dictating your structure and imprinting it upon your environment. So this generally also means that your ego has to become relatively calm, you need to feel safe, you need to feel secure and you need some sense of humility in a way to be able to allow the other person to express themselves and you just taking the position of a listener. So you don't want your energies to project throughout through your hands. You just want to listen using your hands. So make sure your own energy doesn't flow too much in and out of your hands because otherwise you're just washing away the very aura which you're trying to sense, which you're trying to feel. But relax your hands, relax your ego. Going in a very receptive state, willing to listen, willing to uh, give the other person the space, and then slowly move towards them until you can feel that they're there. The next step is if you're making contact with the aura, you might want to eventually move into the aura to feel the deeper layers. But to be able to do that without conflict, without disturbance, you have to reveal yourself, you have to show that you're not an enemy because in general people are competing with other people. So in general people's auras do not stay in a normal state if they're in contact or focusing on somebody else. There's usually a tug of war, some manipulation going on, some dominant struggles going on. And the only way to prevent that from happening is to have no such agenda and to be able to communicate to the other person that you have no such agenda. And this is done by doing two things, opening your third chakra and opening your heart chakra. By opening your third chakra you're in a way showing who am I, what is my game, what is my structure, um, you're in a way putting your cards on the table and revealing yourself.
and say, okay, this is me. This is my blueprint to my ego, to my personality. And you open your heart to show that you have a, a will, a desire, in a way to connect with them, to become one with them. You have a genuine interest in them. And you wish to share with them. And by opening these two chakras and keeping them open while you're working in the aura, you prevent the other person's aura from yeah, starting up all kinds of defensive programming to kick you out or to hide itself from you. So once this is done, your hand should be able to penetrate deeper into the aura. Sensing the aura for me is often the feeling of a kind of a, a pressure. So an aura to me has a kind of a firmness and it can be, if it's a healthy aura, more or less like a balloon where if you put more in more pressure, you get more counter pressure and if you release it, it just bounces back into its normal shape. So this is to me a healthy aura. If the aura is relatively weak, then you can press into it, but it won't bounce back. It's not like a balloon, but it's more to like a piece of bread. Like you, you can impress on it, it, it comes back a little bit, but it doesn't have the same power to, re to regain its, its own shape. So this is typical for an aura which is yeah, a little bit tired or a little bit exhausted or overextended. Um, sometimes you also get something which is more similar to a crust which you just crack and then you punch a hole in it. Um, this is usually the aura of a person who is in a way um, not able to deal with intrusions at all. They're just trying to hold on to what they know. And they're not really responding, really playing with the other person. So they have this more or less crusty structure in their aura. Sensing it is often a, a combination of senses for me. Like on the one hand I feel pressure, on the other hand I often feel um, heat or cold, which can mean there is a lot of energy flowing or there is very little energy flowing or there is a need to be healed for the aura or there is not a need to be healed for the aura. The other thing I often feel is the structure being relatively um, smooth, where in a way the energies can just move around without any resistance, or it can be rough, where it is more or less like sandpaper, so the energy is not able to flow very easily. And the smoothness or the roughness also is often, a, often an indication of the quality of the energetic flow, energetic contact which the aura is, uh, has at that uh, specific point or in that specific area. So can a person deal with things very easily? Are they experienced f with it or are they somewhat inexperienced or afraid or uncomfortable with something? So seeing how smooth or rough it is when compared or when confronted with a specific energy can also give you an indication of how easy it is or how difficult it is for a person to work with that specific energy which is at that time in your hand. The final thing which you can easily determine using your hands is also shapes. And I find that if the shape is also relatively rounded, smooth, this is generally a relatively healthy structure. And if it is very jagged, it is either something which is very new, which hasn't been, in a way, worn down by the erosion of the energies. Uh, so f things which are relatively fresh intrusions into the aura tend to feel more rough, more spiky, than things which have been there a long time. And also the, uh, the rough and spikiness can also be a defensive measure, in a way to also willingly limit the contact or the flow of energies by not being smooth. We then come to uh, the next modality for yeah, knowing the aura, and this is sight. Uh, 
and there are actually um, at least two techniques of aura sight. One technique is basically um, just allowing your aura to make contact with the other person's aura, so you're not doing anything con consciously to really work with that contact or to change that contact. You're just being yourself, the other person is being themselves. And this will generate associations. So just like we have the, the rainbow is one form of association, but also different colors can have different associations. And by picking up the energies, so it's a colors can yeah, associatively be activated in our brains. So we can see brown or yellows or reds and what they mean is very much what they mean to us. We have a feeling like red is often speed and activity, uh, yellow is also a very active energy but more uh, controlled, more connected to the ego. Um, blue is usually more serene, calm, structured. And out of these energies we can also yeah, determine what are predominant colors in the, in the aura. Um, what I find is also that because it's an associative process and also a color process, is that women are a lot better at seeing all these different colors than men are, uh, who are more usually into form and shape, but not so much into the color, into that subtlety. Um, a second way of uh, sensing colors in the aura is actually to do it astrally. So instead of using the associative processes and reverberating together with the other person's aura, you look at the aura from the perspective of a spirit, of an astral being. So you go into the part of yourself which is an, an astral spirit, because we are all astral spirits, and we try to perceive it from its viewpoint. And uh, from that viewpoint it is more... Um, uh, things are very translucent, they exist, you can see them, uh, but you can see them in a more or less multidimensional or at least three-dimensional viewpoint. So it is a little bit more similar to looking at a jellyfish. You can see the near side of the jellyfish, you can see the core of the jellyfish, and you can see the far side of the jellyfish. And in the same way you can also see an aura uh, in that way. It is more uh, a monochrome, you could almost say, than, uh, than color oriented. Although different energies also have a different color coding. But this color coding can be different from the associative color coding, because um, if you look astrally, um, you're more in a, in a common reality rather than an individualized reality as your associative system is. Um, so you will find that if people are looking at an aura and they do it in an associative process, they might see very different colors in the same spot. One might see green, one might see yellow, one might see blue the same spot. But if you ask them what does it mean that you see this, usually they will interpret it in the same way, but they will have a different sensory sensation. Uh, if however you use the astral method of perception, then usually the color perception is the same because it is a more objective reality. So if one person sees blue in the astral, the other person will also see blue in the astral and the third person will also see blue if they're looking in the astral. So that helps. The problem is that um, it is kind of like heavy for the energy body to move the energy out of like the normal living waking structure into the astral dream time body and it tends to upset the physical body. Uh, it is not very healthy, it is rather tiring and exhausting and destabilizing for the uh, physical body to, to do that, to have the spirit in a way leave the body while the body is still trying to function and be conscious at the same time instead of being in a state of rest and relaxation like when it is asleep. Uh, so it has its drawbacks as well as its advantages. 
but if you're wanting to have a very quick view uh, and see the, the shape and the form of the of the different layers and structures uh, within the aura uh, then it can be done quite quickly by moving into the astral and it can also be done by this associative process but then you're more scanning like okay what is here oh there's here a blob which is of a different color and you don't know exactly how close or how far it is so you don't get as much of a 3D image if you're using association as when you're using astral perception but both are quite workable methods and depending upon your uh, yeah, natural way of, of sensing using your uh, using the visual signals and you will find that one method or the other method is, uh, is easiest for you. Um, some typical color coding. The color most often perceived in the aura is blue. Uh, but that is also because all the different shades of blue have a different meaning. So blue is in a way the most complex of colors. Um, so blue is indicative of structure, of order, but this order can be yeah, based on very different things on different, and be organized in very different ways. This creates all the shadings of blue. Um, generally uh, yellow is a fortifying energy. Um, so this can often be sun, uh, seen when a person is in a way trying to fortify themselves or trying to manifest themselves to dominate or to resist domination. Um, usually the um, deeper colors like red and orange um, they usually mean that the person is working with their uh, with their sensitivity, with their body, with their sensuality. Uh, brown is also a common color Brown is usually a relatively off-limits color, so it means that something exists, but it's not being actively used. Um, so these can indicate uh, uh, traumatic experiences, old wounds, um, but also um, undeveloped talents often show up in brown colors. Black is also a very often seen color. Um, Black is usually an indicative of protection, that the person is hiding themselves, is not wanting to be seen, um, is avoiding something. Um, so often also something which is intrusive will be encapsulated in black. Um, some more rare colors are the more metallical colors. More metallical colors often indicate that the aura um, is itself attuned to uh, permanently attuned to something outside. Uh, a silvery color, a silvery web or threads within the aura often indicates that the person has a very strong contact with their spirit guides or with power animals or uh, similar beings. If you have a more um, coppery colors uh, in aura it often means that the person is able to pull energy out of the cosmos so it can be through, of course, a Reiki initiation or something similar. But many people have already, yeah, they are born with this connection. With, they have a natural ability to pull healing energy out of the cosmos or out of their environment and to channel these energies and to manifest them. So this is often the sign of a very coppery color. When there is a lot of golden colors, this usually means that the people are uh, able to attune to the higher spirits, not so much the, the, the spirits which are active on a personal level like guides and power animals, but more towards guiding powers such like agrogores and deities. Um, so if you see these metallical shades, it usually means that the person is in a way um, not alone. They're, uh, part of a, of, a, of a collective and they are the, the physically manifested part of that collective, of the greater group. Um, I also noted uh, a little bit purple and white. Um, 
many people think that white is symbolizing spirituality and purity. Uh, in the aura, this is actually not correct. Uh, Permat purple is. So if there is a lot of purpley colors, it usually means that the person is very sensitive to the more subtle energies in their environment. So they're very in tune with, uh, with the nature, with, their, with the people, with the beings around them. White is actually the color of destruction. So if you see a person with a lot of white in the aura, there are often people who have a very violent, ruthless, uh, destructive nature. Um, so don't follow the, the Christian interpretation of white, but rather the shamanic one, because this is the correct one when you're working with, uh, with aura color. So we have a few more modalities, sound and smell. Some people hear sounds in the aura and some people can also use their voice to transform the aura. Um, the aura is very, very sensitive to sound, so sound healing is usually a very st a strong tonicum for strengthening and making the aura healthy releasing bad energies, purifying the aura. So uh, you can do healings with drums, with flutes, with uh, singing bowls, and they're excellent tonicums for the aura. So for some people it is possible to hear, in a way, the music of the aura, the music of the spheres. You could see the planetary energies which are within the aura. And they can hear by the sounds whether the person is like a Venus person or a Mars person or a solar or a lunar person. And they can also hear the disharmonies within the within that yeah, sound of the aura. And they can sometimes work with those disharmonies by harmonizing them by applying the right sound, which is in a way also the right planetary impulses. So it's a very different perception of the aura you get by working through sound. Um, the sound is, you could say, almost the, the, also the higher form, the higher structure within the aura. So you're, if you're working with sound, you're not working with what is going on with the aura at the moment. Do they like or dislike something at the moment? But you're really working on the deeper layers of the aura, the bones, the skeleton of the aura. You're uh, uh, working with the aura in this uh, in this fashion, or hearing it in that fashion. Smell is, you could say, the contrary. Then you're dealing with the most ephemeral parts of the of the aura. The aura is, in a way, constantly yeah uh, breathing out energies and sniffing energies. And for people who have ability to smell energies, they can smell whether the, from the aura, whether the person is happy, in love, horny, afraid, angry, because they all have very distinct smells. So the aura is exuding a specific vibration, and that vibration can be in a way coded onto a specific smell. So often they will, yeah, literally smell fear or hope or joy or other things and especially of course if there are many people who are together in a similar emotion the smell can be very strong can be almost overwhelming or uh, create an ecstasy in the person experiencing it it's kind of like a perfume um, also in the opposite sense you can also smell sometimes yeah something rotten or something decaying and you can also sometimes find what energy would be healing to them, what smells or foods or energies need to be applied to deal with the rot, to hold the decay and to, uh, in a way, boil up the aura into uh, something tasty again. So my own sense of smell is not um, that well developed, but one important thing to note is also that, um, for instance, spirits, which don't have a normally discernible aura, 
if you uh, yeah, are trying to sense it with your hands or with association uh, or with sounds, can be smelled. So uh, the ability to, to smell energies also allows you to smell the much more subtle emanations of, uh, of spirits which are not auras per se. Um, the other advantage of, uh, uh, of smell is also it is a, a channel to which there is relatively little uh, resistance. So if you're trying to use your hands to heal a person's aura, you will have to go through many layers of resistance because it is a relatively low, dense energy. It's really the energy of form, of physicality. And because the aura is much higher, it tends to defend itself against these lower energies and to shy away from the person's hands. So you really have to build up a lot of trust to work with your hands. Um, if you're working with eyes, it's already much easier to, to in a way, penetrate the aura defenses. If you're working with sound, it's kind of like um, almost um, people can have a, a counter reaction, a counter vibration to that, but most people tend not to know how to react so they tend to allow the sound to work upon them. So that's even easier. And with smell, that's usually the easiest. People just respond to it without being able to, uh, to control themselves or their reactions to it. So healing through food, through smell is really a, a non-resistance method. And if you're dealing with a client who has lots of resistance, then yeah, to be able to work with food and smell or with sound is really much easier than to be able to work with sight, with color, with or with touch. Um, the disadvantage is also that the effects are also because they are so much more higher energies, they're also much more fleeting energies. So you can influence the person, but usually if the person changes environment or half an hour later, also the influence tends to disappear. Uh, sound is much more longer lasting. The effects of a sound healing can last days or even weeks. While uh, if you're working with smell and taste, usually the effect has to be applied almost continuously because within a few days it will dissipate if you stop applying it. So you have to usually apply the smell or the scent over a period of time to really create a change into the deeper structures of the aura. Um, so you could say um, touch is in a way too low for the aura, so it will resist against it. And smell is in a way too high for the aura, so it cannot completely hold on to it. So I hope this uh, gives some insight into the, um, how to work with different sensory modalities and the aura.